For what must you prepare? Why must you do a risk assessment before writing a plan? Well, knowing the risk ensures proper preparation for the most significant or most likely scenarios, while minimizing resources assigned to least critical. Making a facility-specific plan means knowing your facility-specific risk factors. Making a plan starts with assessing the risks. Let's get started. You may choose to use one of the risk assessment templates provided in this program or make your own to guide you in making your own location and facility specific evaluation. Don't forget, use your partners. They have existing risk assessments to start and to augment your own. A robust contingency plan for a captive wildlife facility means preparing the facility to maintain minimal operations for their collections for at least 72 hours in the event of some incident. This 72 hour goal is based on the minimum Federal Emergency Management Agency's recommendations to U.S. citizens to have a plan in place for disasters. In reality, as you'll see from your sister facility's experiences, 72 hours is really insufficient for most significant events. Most require alternative operational and recovery periods of weeks to months. Plans must be facility specific. Just inserting your name on someone else's plan is a recipe for failure. However, Audubon Zoo, for example, did work closely with Miami Metro Zoo after Hurricane Andrew ravaged South Florida. Much of Audubon's successful planning in response to Katrina was attributed to and reflective of the lessons learned and then shared between these institutions. Use your colleagues' experience and expertise. Just don't cut and paste their plans into yours. Obviously, the low probability minimal consequences are of the least concern. The other incidents should be evaluated and prioritized for planning. Some examples of how to evaluate the risks will be provided at the end of this section in the form of some charts and organizational schemes. Where do we look to assess the risks to our institutions? Well, we got to look inside and outside of our institution. The nature of captive wildlife facilities creates facility-specific risks. Many internal episodic emergency plans are based on internal risk assessment, things like animal scape, fire, medical, things like that. Sadly today, we must even include the possibility of an active shooter or a criminal assault at a facility. Again, in the workbook, there are some examples and templates to help define what internal risks exist and what may be required to address them. The animal inventory is often one of the first places to start. From there, we can look at internal hazardous materials, construction, and other sources of risk. The risk and the needs analysis, covered in the next section, may include defining exactly what specialized equipment is needed for disaster escapes, personal protective gear, animal handling or transport, and things like that. This might be important information for responders to know as well. You need to share this information in partner briefings, documents, meetings, and with facility staff, and so forth. Internal risks are often based on the animal inventory. Animals may present risk to people, to wildlife, and to agricultural animals as well. Animals also vary in their own vulnerability to various types of disasters and incidents. Species vulnerabilities are risk factors as well. Relative vulnerability to adverse conditions or infectious disease, they've got to be considered. What species in your collection are particularly sensitive to smoke or what about water quality or contamination? Excessive heat, prolonged cold, with aquatic species, viability is short without filtration, aeration, oxygenation, and circulation. The New Orleans Aquarium lost almost every animal in Katrina when they simply lost power. Critical climate controlled exhibits such as penguin habitats or tropical displays may be particularly vulnerable. These exhibits may require special considerations. Prioritize risk assessment based on your species inventory and those unique risks that they do create. 
dangerous animals are a liability and a risk to the public, to the first responders, and the staff. Animal care professionals understand those risks associated with the species in their collections, but the public and your first responders may not. In an event, animal management equipment and enclosures may be damaged or functioning improperly. You must share your facility information with your partners, who may be your responders, and they'll help you write that plan. Ensure your collection considerations are discussed with the entire team, and that special handling requirements are also considered for both collection animals as well as wild animals that may breach your facility perimeter in a disaster. Not all dangerous species are carnivores, or even venomous. Many wildlife professionals would rather deal with an escaped puma than a loose chimp. Certainly, megavertebrates present both risk and challenges with either evacuation or with containment. Once again, the collection inventory determines the infectious disease risk. Your animals can be disease victims that are affected by the infection, or they may be disease vectors that can transmit the disease without apparently even being affected themselves, or they may simply act as disease reservoirs in which the disease can remain for years, such as a wildebeest and malignant catarrhal fever, as an outbreak in Texas demonstrated a few years back. It's important to know which of your species are vulnerable to which diseases and whether the USDA cares about those diseases. That's your veterinarian's job. Make sure they know how to contact your state veterinarian for guidance. Infectious diseases are a concern for collection every day. Most captive wildlife are somewhat in isolation from the outside world already. However, with emerging diseases or foreign animal diseases, additional precautions have to be taken. Make sure you involve your veterinarian in your risk assessment process so they can assist with the infectious disease planning. Foreign animal diseases are of great concern to the agricultural community. These diseases would most likely arise in agricultural species and then end up at your doorstep. Identify the farm types or other domestic livestock in your region to assess your risk of exposure to these diseases from the surrounding farms. Poultry production facilities make avian influenza a greater risk than cattle stockyards might. Consider which local wildlife or agricultural species pose a disease risk to your institution. Wild waterfowl, for example, can be an avian influenza vector, or they can be reservoirs of avian influenza. Do waterfowl use your central pond while they're migrating? Your veterinarian should know the state veterinarian and include them in the planning development. The veterinarian should be USDA accredited and familiar with USDA district director. The district director should help you address the state reportable animal diseases, federal reportable diseases, and USDA program diseases in the plan. Your veterinarian will help with this. Which of your species are susceptible to diseases of agricultural concern? There's a table at the end of the workbook, Collection Wildlife Species Vulnerability to USDA Reportable Diseases. This will help you identify diseases for which you should be concerned and your veterinary staff can address individually. Close communications between your vet staff, the state vet's office, and the USDA is also essential to your collection disaster plan. A single structural fire on grounds is an emergency, but planning for it may be quite different than planning for a fire disaster such as a forest or wildland fire or advanced structural fires in the adjacent urban structures. For one, in large events, the fire department may be busy, may have more than your facility on their plate. Don't forget that wildlife are property and thus a lower priority than human life or shelter. What hazardous materials do you have or store on site? Use your safety data sheet notebook and share this information with your local fire department. They're the experts in management of hazardous materials. Are your hazardous materials stored safely? Don't forget that many facilities store biological specimens and formalin, and although we use it all the time, this material is considered hazardous as well. What else do you store at your facility? Diesel fuel? Propane? Facility fertilizers can even be lethal alone or in combination with other chemicals. Make sure your maintenance professional assists you with identification of agricultural chemicals that you do store on site. Proper fertilizer storage information can be found at the Fertilizer Institute website and the links provided in the workbook. A chlorine gas leak killed three gorillas at a small Texas zoo a number of years back. The chlorine was used for cleaning purposes at the zoo. 
but being heavier than air, chlorine leaked from a storage container and then filled a low-lying gorilla habitat. Two night zookeepers were exposed to chlorine early in the morning. Three gorillas were already unconscious and others suffering from chlorine inhalation whenever the EMS and fire department arrived. Nine other gorillas and two staff members trying to assist the animals were also affected. Three gorillas died. It could have been two night keemers too. One young male gorilla, a three-year-old ape, was in critical condition. He had to be put on a ventilator and under sedation. EMS, with the help of zookeepers, were able to rescue eight other gorillas, which did recover. But the zookeepers were also treated and released at a local hospital. Authorities suspect a space heater caused a fire that melted the plastic chlorine container. External risk factors are the risk we usually think of in a risk assessment. These are usually out of your control, but within your power to anticipate, diminish the impact, or mitigate their severity. Use the information resources at your fingertips, that is your keyboard. Numerous risk assessment website resources are available, and many of them are listed at the end of the workbook. Don't forget to acquire the local EMS, city, state risk assessments by involving your local emergency manager in your risk assessment and planning efforts. Then build on those. Disease outbreaks outside the facility can still place the captive wildlife at risk. If they're agricultural animals, the state veterinarian and USDA may even get involved. How do you evaluate the hurricane risk for your institution? Well, NOAA provides 170 years of global hurricane data, which may be sorted by date, location, name, and even which ocean they're in. Remember, many scientists agree that actual Global hurricane probability may exceed the recent historical frequency and severity due to global climate change. Go to the NOAA site, and maybe some others, and acquire the relevant data for your specific geographic location, and go back at least 50 years. You can incorporate the Safer Simpson Severity Scale to construct your historical event risk reference. A copy is available in the notebook. The New Orleans Zoo lost only three of its 1,200 animals to the wrath of Hurricane Katrina. That's all that died. The wind was the primary destructive force, as they weren't flooded on the high grounds of the zoo. However, it toppled large trees and knocked down branches throughout the 52-acre park. The zoo worked closely with Miami Metro Zoo to create their own plan after Hurricane Andrew hit Florida. The zoo stockpiled fuel food, and other supplies, enough for several days. Post the hurricane, they acquired additional food by stripping large amounts of leaves from the trees and mixed that in with other food to extend the provisions. Some things like hay, crickets, and mealworms were obtained by staff convoys to and from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where the infrastructure was still intact. A Storm Rider team of 14 staffers stayed at the zoo. Staff sheltered in the sturdy reptile building and raided the zoo cafeteria for food. The assistant curator said after the hurricane that the biggest problem now are the low-flying helicopters buzzing around. Who would have thought about that risk? Meanwhile, at the aquarium across down, though, Katrina killed almost all of their animals. Before the hurricane, the aquarium was considered one of the foremost aquariums in the world. But, located on Canal Street along Mississippi River, flooding was inevitable. Filtration, circulation, oxygenation systems lost electrical power, and the staff also had to evacuate for safety. Most of the 10,000 fish, representing more than 530 species, died. Luckily, the sea otters, the penguins, sea dragons, some birds, and a, a white alligator were fine. Several resources are available for tornado risk assessment online. Your partners also have excellent information. A website in the workbook provides a searchable database by geographic location, state, county, year, month, and day for every U.S. tornado recorded from 1950 to the present. At a zoo in Belvedere, Illinois on April 10, 2015, an ESF-1 tornado with winds of only 65 to 110 miles per hour, the zoo was damaged significantly. But a nearby ESF-3 
4 tornado also touched down, which could have affected them as well. In this case, it killed only two zoo animals, an emu and a black swan, but the facility itself was devastated. The risk was not just the loss of an emu or a swan, because their other collection animals included hyena, tiger, puma, and wolf. Luckily, no large predators escaped. But such an event potentially places people at risk should the predators' enclosures have been damaged as well. Remember, flooding can occur with no local rain events. It did in Minot, North Dakota. An interactive flood map from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, can be found in the notebook. Flood maps by zip code can be found on another website provided as well. Regional flood risk assessments are also available from the U.S. Geological Survey, which provides historical flood inundation maps. And don't forget your partners, they usually know the flood risks. In 2011, at the Roosevelt Zoo in Minot, North Dakota, disaster struck and the cash flow stopped for months because the zoo was closed due to catastrophic flooding. Likewise, animal care was maintained for months off-site. Not only was there no incoming revenue, but many refunds were required too. The membership dues had to be refunded, event tickets, and summer camp. They weren't just closed, they were paying to be closed. In fact, the Roosevelt Park Zoo was unable to open all summer and not open again for the rest of that year. But the press was good to them and called it a successful disaster response plan. New York Times headline, two by two or not, the zoo animals escaped flood. How did they accomplish the flood evacuation of their entire collection? Well, the zoo shut down following a mandatory evacuation notice by the city of Minot, North Dakota. The 90-year-old zoo straddles the Suris River, also known as the Mouse River, and it was also flooded in 1969. The flood was predicted several days in advance due to rain upstream, not the rain just in Minot. The animals were taken to multiple locations. The smaller reptiles were housed in a hockey rink locker room. Local farmers agreed to take some of the llamas, alpacas, bison, elk. But the majority of the critters were taken to a former furniture warehouse. This is why you got to think out of the box. Many zoo animals spent more than a month in that building. Although the zoo was reopened early next year, it was longer before the animals all returned. They had a challenging search to find someone in a neighboring state with a trailer able to accommodate a giraffe. And then it took even longer to convince the giraffe to go into it. Most of the entire day was required uh, just to corral the bison. Remember your partners? Well, police officers were on hand when the three bears were anesthetized and they provided lethal force protection. FEMA provides an excellent resource for researching the risk for the United States. The website address and a workbook, well, it's pretty easy to find online too. Tropical animals need power for heat in Minnesota winter, and many species are vulnerable to excessive heat in Nevada summer. Wildlife facilities hold many species with specialized or narrow environmental requirements that must be accommodated by some kind of artificial means. Many weather events can interrupt that technology upon which they depend to maintain life. Fire, water contamination, chemical spills, nuclear fallout, earthquakes. Ask your partners. They're your experts, and they know for what your location should be prepared. Let's talk about a few. Millions of acres are reliably destroyed annually by wildfire. If you are in its path, it may be impossible to avoid its consequences. Preparation for such events goes far beyond those for an on-site structural fire. And don't forget, even home fires, most deaths do not occur from incineration or burning to death, but from smoke inhalation. Smoke can cause severe medical concerns for both the staff and the animals. Birds and other sensitive species may suffer or succumb to the smoke while the fire is still miles away. Not only the direction of the fire itself may be predicted, but smoke plume predictions based on prevailing winds may be available for your partners as well. So, how do you determine fire risk? The historical and current wildfire data can be acquired from several sources. Website references are in the workbook, of course. They'll help you evaluate the risk of wildland fires for institutions' geographic location. And you can sort by date, location, country, and severity. 
What surrounds your facility? What's upstream? What's upwind? Evaluation of more distant risks is prudent for many types of events. Risks should also be considered in relationship to meteorological and hydrological dynamics. A severe oil spill 50 miles downstream facility is far less concerning than one 150 miles upstream from your facility. On January 9, 2009, on the Elk River in West Virginia, a chemical spill contaminated the water supply of nearly 300,000 West Virginians. 600 people checked themselves in the local hospitals. Only approximately 10,000 gallons of coal washing agent were estimated to actually have leaked into the Elk River. But for weeks, nearly 300,000 people were told not to drink or even bathe in the local tap water. The chemical was 4-methylcyclohexane methanol, or 4-MCHM. The 48,000-gallon tank that leaked into the Elk River was rusty, and it was built in 1938. What's more concerning, state inspectors found 1,100 other tanks did not meet the requirements either. Are any of them upstream from you? The spill plume traveled all the way into Kentucky via the river, at least 390 miles downriver. Are you within 390 miles of a toxic chemical storage site? A plume is an active dispersal and expansion of transported material across a geographic location. The smoke plume from fires in Southern California, for example, inundated the San Diego metropolitan area from fires over 50 miles away. The volcanic particulate plume of Mount St. Helens produced widespread devastation to the east, while the western coastal cities received only a fraction. Upstream oil spill plumes in the Mississippi are actually a regular occurrence. But you want to know where you are in relation to those. Rail yards and highway accidents, nuclear plants or other infrastructure that, if damaged, can produce a plume of hazardous materials, those could affect your facility. While these are low probability events, they are high consequence events. Make sure you discuss these risks with your planning team. Informational resources from NOAA, U.S. Geologic Survey, the National Weather Service, they're available to predict from what direction a plume may approach your facility. Knowing from what directions toxins may approach, you can identify distant sources which may impact or approach your facility. Crude oil and fossil fuel related spills are more common than you might expect. Oil spills happen all the time, and most without any news coverage. Your EMS partners will know where the local and upstream and local storage sites are. Transported petroleum products may be the wild card. Transportation accidents are far less predictable where they might occur. However, the more that is shipped near your facility, the greater the risk. Ask your partners. Coal ash ponds are storage ponds containing waste effluent from coal-powered plants. They're relatively unregulated by the EPA, but they are toxic. They're poorly identified, and they're anywhere coal power plants exist. A recent inspection included 81 dams and ponds rated as high potential for life loss or serious damage, and 250 more ponds were rated as significant for coal ash. How many are upstream from your facility? Hazmats may travel extensively via chemical plumes in the air or the water. You don't have to be very close to be affected. An emergency response guide, ERG, is available free online. It's updated every year, and now it's available as an app, of course. It lists hazmats and describes their properties such as flammability, corrosive, caustic, and such as that. It also shows you how to interpret transport placards you may see on vehicles. No time for animal salvation may be possible with some very hazardous, volatile, toxic chemicals. Are you ready for an immediate human evacuation if a spill should occur near you? One of the largest means of hazmat transportation is by rail car tanker. The most common rail transport routes and historical spill sites 
may be found on our website. You'll find in the workbook. Transport of materials data for any rail company is available on their own websites. Let's consider just one of the most common and very dangerous hazmats that's transported daily all over the United States. Chlorine. Like the small Texas zoo, in which their own chlorine stockpile caused a life to be lost of three gorillas, chlorine gas and liquid chlorine are significant risk everywhere they're short or shipped. It was outlawed as a weapon after World War II because of the horrible and painful death. As late as August 2016, chlorine's ass was still used as a chemical weapon of mass destruction in the Middle East. Just to give you an idea how much is around, the U.S. produces 13 million tons of liquefied chlorine every year. Individual rail cars hold 90 tons each, and they're often several in tandem. Even roadway tank trucks contain 20 tons each. So, how much does it take to create a disaster near you? Well, the CDC evacuation recommendations for only 55 gallons of chlorine if a spill occurs, is one and a half miles downwind in the daytime or evacuation five miles downwind at night because of slow dispersal. This is why wind and water directions are critical in a toxic plume. Is your facility within five miles of a railroad? Chlorine's heavier than air. It accumulates in low areas, sewers, basements, valleys, including your facility basement, or your low-lying gorilla enclosure. Chlorine spills require immediate human evacuation. An example, in Graniteville, South Carolina, in 2005, there was a rail disaster, occurred about 2 a.m. in the morning. Two trains collided, transporting chlorine and sodium hydroxide, another caustic base, and some cresol. Just one of those tankers, loaded with 90 tons of chlorine, ruptured. Only 60 tons escaped. But nine people died from chlorine inhalation, and over 250 people were treated. 5,400 residents were evacuated, and it took two weeks to clean it up. How much chlorine do you store at your own facility for disinfection or for aquatic systems? Is it stored in your facility basement? Don't forget, dry chlorine may also become volatile and become airborne as it did in that small Texas zoo and killed those three gorillas. Nuclear facilities are all over the country. Although the probability is low, the results of a compromise may be catastrophic. Radiological preparedness information is available from the FEMA Radiological Emergency Preparedness Information online. Do you know where you are in relation to a facility and for which direction a plume might approach? Informational resources are available from NOAA, USGS, and National Weather Service also to predict from what direction a plume may approach you. Knowing what direction toxins may approach, you can identify distant sources which may impact your facility. Four nuclear power plants on the Great Lakes rank among the nation's worst for high-level safety violations. Are you near one? The U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission provides information on all nuclear facilities, they provide the location, proximity of nuclear power plants to your facility, and they can be found at their website, and of course, it's in our workbook. A regional preparedness plan already exists for any location within 50 miles of any nuclear plant. Your partners probably already have it. Are you located within 50 miles? Ask them. The volcanic particulate from the plume of Mount St. Helens produced widespread devastation to the east, while the western coastal cities received only a fraction of that, and again, knowing not only where you are, but which way the wind blows, the river flows, can help you assess those relative risks. Seismic events and tsunami are intensively studied, and geographical data is plentiful. Volcanic eruptions are actually seismic events, of course, and are located along fault lines. Where are volcanoes and fault lines in relationship to your facility? Upwind? Downwind? Downstream? Seismic events can be researched by date, state, and location, on the USGS website. But keep in mind, seismic events may yield tsunami. They form and can affect locations thousands of miles away. If you're on the Pacific coast, the seismology of Japan may actually be a greater threat than the San Andreas Fault that runs through San Francisco. Tsunami risk assessment and threat zones 
can be found at several websites. Remember, tidal waves can also travel great distance up coastal rivers as well. If you're up the Columbia River in Washington State, you might still get a slosh. Data is available, though, through multiple organizations listed in the workbook. So, don't forget that one disaster may lead to another, and it may be a totally different type of event. Sometimes they're called cascading events, or they may be considered secondary or tertiary disasters. In flooding, vectors like mosquitoes, their population may explode. You may also get wetness in the buildings, and aspergillus, a type of fungus that kills a lot of birds, uh, may grow uncontrollably. Your partners are still your best source to get a jump and minimize your research time. Engage them in your risk assessment early and often. It'll save you some work. There are many means of assessing risk, and we're going to give you just a couple of examples that have been used by our colleagues. Take a look at these, see how you might best evaluate your own risks. This is just another example, but your local partners may have much of this information already. Start collecting the information and set up your risk assessment the way it works best for you. Some other risk assessment websites can be very helpful and they're also available in a workbook. There are important points that you want you to consider from this module. First, make sure you're involving your partners in the risk assessment process. They'll help provide some of the research needed to be thorough. They've already done a lot of the work for you. Identify the high likelihood and the high consequence incidents and disasters. Those are the instances on which you should initially concentrate when you start looking at your needs and limitations and before you sit down to write your plan. Remember to spend some time thinking about your facility infrastructure and your collection and, and their vulnerabilities. Make sure those unique risks are communicated to all your planning partners during the risk assessment process. So, what's next? Well, let's figure out what you need to make it happen. Let's make a needs list based on the risks you've just identified. 